Okay, well, maybe we will get started. Yep. If you have a few latecomers, um, also have the recording, of course. So, um, hello, good morning, good evening. Um, thank you for coming, dear colleagues. Thank you for taking uh, an hour of your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, for, for those that didn't join last time, my name is Caroline Hasperter, and I am the data communication lead in the chief data officer officer's office in DAPM. Uh, with me today are Tumiko. She's a communication specialist. Um, she's currently here on stretch from DGCA. And she is the main organizer of this webinar today, which is going to be on maps. Um, she is going to present something really interesting about map projections and distortions. Uh, so I think something very thought provoking and out of the ordinary. Um, then we have something quite practical by Yanis Melens, who is a customer success manager at Infogram. Infogram, for those that don't know, is our enterprise uh, tool for creating interactive charts and maps. Um, we also have enterprise licenses for that. And uh, then we have with us uh, Jan Burczek, who is our geospatial lead here at UNICEF. And he will talk about more advanced tools and practices when it comes to geospatial. And then at the end, we will have uh, probably 15, 20 minutes for questions and, and interactions. And yeah, with that, uh, over to Tomiko. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so I wanna start with a definition of a map. If you can chat, type in the chat, like what you think a map is, what your definition of or understanding of a map is, um, I don't know if you ever thought about that. We use map all the time now, right? We carry around um, interactive map in our, on our phone, in our pocket all the time. But what do you think is a, um, what do you think a map is? I don't know if you want to be brave to type your definition in the chat. Um, it's interesting to know what you think a map is. A visualization of different elements on a canvas. It's a representation of the earth reflected on other media such as paper. Good one. Visual representation of data slash information. Right. Any other takers? Um, so I think these are all very good um, visual location of data. I think these are all very good um, definition of understanding of a map. Um, so I looked at two different dictionaries for uh, definitions of a map. This is a kind of an academic approach to understanding what something is, but um, Oxford Language Dictionary says it's a diagram dia diagrammatic representation of an area of land or sea showing physical features, cities, roads, etc. And Merriam-Webster says it's a diagram or other visual representation that shows the relative position of the parts of something. And then I had to, of course, consult my recent favorite tool, ChatGPT. And when I asked what a map is, it said it's a visual representation of an area used to convey information about its geography, topography, or infrastructure. It can be created using surveys, satellite imagery, or digital mapping software, and used for navigation, planning, or analysis. It's a quite thorough definition, I would say. Um, so. As you saw in this slide, um, all of the definitions um, that I found use the term representation. And I want you to keep that on the back of your head because I'll come back to that word in, at the end. So how do you actually make a map? Um, so to make a map, we use what we call map projections because Earth is a, a three-dimensional sphere, right? It's an orb. So how would you transfer that onto a two-dimensional plane, like a flat surface, flat object? To do that, we need uh, projections. And there are many types of projections. And um, these are three, I guess, major map projection types. They, these are the three families of projections you can find. And um, producing how to actually produce these projections are quite technical. Um, and you can, I, I put these resources so that you can uh, read through 
different types of projections and how they're produced actually. But for the purpose of this presentation, it's not so important that we understand how these are actually produced. But one thing that I want you to walk away from this presentation today is that it's impossible to represent Earth's surface in two dimensions without distortion. Um, every map projection comes with some kind of uh, different types of distortions and um, in varying degrees. So that's one thing that I want you to sort of take away from today's presentation. Um, to put that in context, so I, um, Caroline shared with me this online article uh, on website called Uncharted Territories, and it really um, helps you understand the distortions that are inherent in maps. So inevitably, in many maps, countries closer to the equator appear smaller than they actually are. And many of us develop this poor intuition of comparative region sizes. So here you can see uh, on the right side, um, these different countries and regions uh, are overlaid over the continent of Africa. And you can sort of, you can see right very clearly how large Africa is. But if I feel that a lot of the maps that we're used to seeing doesn't doesn't represent that very well, right? Because Africa, because it's so close to the equator or it's over the equator, it tends to be smaller than they actually are. So the African continent is most disadvantaged in this regard. As you can see like the US, China, Eastern Europe, that's a whole region of a continent can fit into um, the side of, uh, where uh, uh, the size of the Africa. So, and, and similarly, um, you can see here on the left side, US and Australia are overlaid over Europe. So you can sort of see the comparison, the size comparison. Um, and here on the right side, uh, this is Chile. You can see how long really Chile is, right? But it's kind of hard to see that in a map that we're used to seeing. And also, if not just the size, but where um, when we were looking at a map, we're used to seeing uh, a certain part of the, the world being centered on the map. So I feel I think um, in the map that we're used to seeing, uh, the United Kingdom uh, or London is centered because that's where the reference median goes through. Uh, but here, like in this map, this is an old map from Japan. Uh, Japan is the center of the map. So it, it seems probably strange to see a map that's centered around different city or country that you're not seeing, you're not used to seeing. But um, again, it's, you know, this sort of, this should remind you that map is a human and social construct. It's something that we created to make a sense of the world around us. And it's not really a real thing, right? Um, so you can, you can make, the, make a map differently um, and it gives you a different angle of the world. And here too, like um, this is a, I think this is a Google map, but it has a line uh, over Michigan, which is a state in the United States, but it gives you a um, different point of view that all of um, continental South America lies actually east of Michigan, which um, is really not how you're used to seeing North and South Americas, right? So, and when you lay out a co different continents and regions this way, it that you're not used to seeing, it's it takes a minute to really even know what you're looking at. When I first saw this image, um, it took me a while to realize, oh, this is U.S. and this is South America and this is Mexico. Um, I've never really thought about. Um, the two continents like this before, and it gives you a sort of a different understanding or interesting relations between regions and continents. So, and all of this is to say, and this is now coming back to the word um, representation that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. Um, representation, according to Oxford Languages Dictionary, is a description or portrayal of someone or something in a particular way or as being a certain nature. And so, I mean, we, we understand what representation means, right? But when we are exposed to a particular way of seeing something, particular way of representing something, we start to see the representation is the thing in itself. 
Um, but we need to be mindful that it's really not. Um, in in MAPS case, like it comes with distortions and we need to be aware of uh, different biases that may create, that it may create. And especially when we work at an organization like UNICEF, I mean, I think we need to be aware that MAP is not is not the absolute truth of the world that we live in, and that it comes with certain distortions, biases, and um, we shouldn't take it at face value. So that was my very short um, presentation on maps and their distortions. So I'll finish there. And we'll go over to, so from very sort of theoretical conceptual talk about map, we'll go to very uh, sort of more practical <laughs> talk about map, uh, hands-on things that Yanis can walk us through in Infogram. Thank you. Thank you, Tomiko, and thank you for your presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Yanis. I'm a customer success manager here at Infogram. What that means practically is I work with, uh, with UNICEF and other customers uh, in various industries with their data visualization needs. Infogram is a tool that some of you might be familiar with. And if you're not, then after today's presentation, hopefully you'll be a little more familiar with it. Um, so my goal here today is to give you a short introduction on the map possibilities with Infogram. Now, uh, what I think is really interesting is that Tomiko mentioned the various definitions of a map. And I will clarify that um, in our world, the map is what we typically think of as a geographical map. So that's what uh, my presentation will be focused on today. Um, and so what I wanted to start with is kind of uh, an example of an infogram map and some of the benefits on why uh, utilizing infogram to create maps can be, can be useful. So um, firstly, uh, and what's I think really important also in the already mentioned uh, representation aspect is that uh, the maps that we use uh, have uh, UN confirmed frontiers and a disclaimer built into the map uh, that allows us to present data in uh, the best and most honest way possible, uh, even though it is in a two dimensional and stretched uh, view and that can uh, be misleading. And I think that point about how many uh, other parts of the world can fit into Africa is a super interesting uh, thing as a general uh, kind of takeaway as well. The second thing uh, why Infogram is a good tool for maps is that you do have the possibility to also include other custom maps for smaller or more specific regions of the world. And with UNICEF, we have, uh, we have some of those inside the tool as well. And that is also possible to do for some future use cases if need be. And the third thing is that it has built-in UNICEF branding, so you don't have to worry about uh, not looking on brand when you're sharing this out with your, with your audience, whether that's the general public or uh, other partners or colleagues within UNICEF. Uh, the maps are interactive when shared online. You can add hyperlinks. You can highlight certain sections. And there is no coding required. There is, of course, a bit of a learning curve, like any, any visual tool, you have to learn it. And uh, we do provide training for that uh, from our side if needed as well. Uh, and with a map, all you need is one Excel spreadsheet uh, with the data, and then you can plot that onto an infogram map. And we'll go through that a little bit later on in the presentation as well. Before we get into the actual creation of maps, uh, I wanted to provide an overview of what kind of maps you can create with Infogram. So we have uh, what we call two map types on Infogram. One would be an area map. So that's a map like this, where you have predefined regions. These could be countries. These could be municipalities or regions within a certain country. These could be uh, groups of countries like continents or other regions uh, on there. And with an area map, you are uh, visualizing data on something that uh, applies to that entire territory. While with an icon map, uh, you are able to plot specific locations, whether that's cities, uh, countries, uh, villages, or even specific coordinates or addresses across a city, for instance. So you are able to pinpoint uh, the location uh, of, of a certain place on uh, your infogram map. Um, once you've chosen your map type, there's uh, three map styles to choose from. So what this means is that you have the ability to visualize data as a heat map. This is a great way how to uh, visualize 
uh, the prevalence of something in a certain region. Uh, so, you know, let's say this is a map about my travel experiences and at the number, the value represents how many times I've been to a certain country. I, of course, wish I would have been to Greenland eight times. Well, not technically the case, but that is how a heat map works. You're able to showcase uh, the prevalence or the uh, kind of uh, importance of something in specific regions. A grouped map allows you to group uh, your uh, map data in uh, smaller segments so that you're working with uh, a specific amount of segments. This is great for visualizing, for instance, any sort of survey data where you want to group maybe by ranges of results or percentage points or something similar. And then the third map is an individual map, which kind of gives you a nice legend entry for each location. And here I'll do a little caveat on individual maps. This is kind of a, a big don't in our book typically, because what happens is, as you can see, the legend is uh, super large and it really uh, takes away from the map itself. So uh, I would say that the individual map is best placed for visualizing certain locations and when there's not a huge amount of them. So for instance, today I'm in Riga, Latvia. That's where I'm talking to you from and that's where uh, Infogram is also based. We have some people over in New York and there might even be someone from Australia or Kenya or Argentina on the call maybe today. And so I think this is a great way how to utilize an individual map where you are pinpointing a couple of locations that you want to highlight specifically uh, for some reason, whether by providing additional information in the tooltip like I did with my name here, uh, or just kind of uh, showcase that uh, this is present for that specific topic. Another great way uh, how you can uh, utilize infogram maps, uh, what we just looked at were kind of ways to present static data. Uh, and so what is also sort of new on our site is the ability to present data over a timeline. So on top of the geographical aspect, you get to add the uh, time aspect in the form of dates or months or years. And again, showcase either uh, specific locations. If we imagine that this is uh, how many hospitals are in each of these locations or office buildings or whatever else, and when they were opened over a period of time, or just uh, other sort of metrics that can change over time and how they increase or decrease uh, in, in that way. Um, so this is on timeline maps. Now, at this point, I will exit my presentation, uh, which is we made on Infogram, by the way. With Infogram, you can create from anything, uh, anything from a single map or a single chart up to a presentation, report, an infographic, all depending on uh, how much time you have and how much you really want to create something uh, really good looking. It's absolutely all possible. What I wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time now is the, as mentioned before, practical part on how to actually create a map. I'll scroll up and we'll see that, for instance, for this individual map where I'm pinpointing locations, it's as simple as entering the city and country, and the map will just generate the coordinates automatically. One thing to note is this has to be the title in English uh, because it's connected to a database of uh, English names. And so with this way, you are able to pinpoint locations, and all you have to then do is to adjust the values if needed, and then if you want to group, you can add those groups additionally and, and provide some additional uh, text information uh, in the additional uh, columns of the data file. With timeline maps, it looks uh, quite similar. You have the English title. Uh, so for the location, you have the values. Uh, this one has the groups predefined as well as it's a group map in this case. Coordinates are generated again from the English title. So we don't have to worry about that. And the label is what actually will show up on the maps tooltip, for instance. So the English title kind of feeds the coordinates and the label appears on the map tooltip itself. Uh, and with the timeline map, what comes here uh, as an additional thing is the uh, start date and end date. So here, just you navigate to the cog icon and make sure that the date input format you're using matches uh, what you have in your data. And that way you can then enter the start dates and end dates. And that creates this playable experience where you can have uh, icons or areas popping up at the certain dates entered in the start date and disappearing at the end dates. Or if there's no information there, there will just uh, remain on the map uh, when it stops 
playing as well. Now, uh, what I did for, uh, for today is I took the world map, the uh, UN confirmed world map is accessible to all UNICEF users. You just have to go to the add map section in the left sidebar, and you have to click on the map categories. And there you will find that you have a special UNICEF folder here. And under that UNICEF folder at the very bottom, you will see that there is a world countries map which is this map, as you can also see here on the right hand, right hand side panel. And so now uh, what I've done is I've removed all of the data, all of the default data from, uh, from this specific map. And I'll jump over to my Google Sheet now where I have uh, some data input. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is we have a specific uh, data format that we saw in any of the other maps. So we have the English title, the value, the group, the coordinates, the label, and for a timeline map, the start date and end date. And so uh, what I like to do is I like to export the entire uh, default map data file to a spreadsheet of some sort, where I can then work with uh, the specific columns, keeping in mind that this is English title, this is value, here we can add groups, this is coordinates, the label, and then start dates and end dates for timelines in this case as well. And so what I can do now is I can simply take uh, my uh, data from this specific uh, spreadsheet. These are UNICEF national committee uh, countries, locations where uh, UNICEF national committees are located. And I can just go into Infogram and just paste this in and we can immediately see that we have an icon map prepared. Now, I uh, made it an icon map beforehand. Uh, so you can do that in the map properties. We talked about the map types. So you select your map type, uh, whether it's an area map or an icon map. With an area map, we will be highlighting all the countries in whole where we have uh, UNICEF National Committee locations. And with an icon map, we will be pinpointing them using icons. Uh, the icon can be customized uh, lower in the uh, map properties here. Uh, and if you prefer, you also have the ability to add something like a tile layer to provide uh, a specific background that already has either continent names or even country names so that you have uh, maybe a bit of an easier uh, to understand uh, overall look and feel of the map. Uh, we can see that on the icons, we have the names of the countries. And in this case, just the value one, because in this case, I'm not showcasing any uh, any amounts of anything. I'm just pinpointing locations uh, and the values can also be uh, hidden if needed. And we see that we have also a specific lo uh, legend entry for each location. And if I hover over it, that will uh, highlight on the map uh, as well. Now, uh, once I have entered uh, my data here, uh, if I wanted to now, for instance, make this a timeline map, I would just go to the map properties. I would turn on the timeline function, and we can see that now there is no data. This is because we have the start date and end date uh, columns empty, but it's a good thing that I've prepared for this, and I've added some years. These years, I have to note, are fictional. Uh, these are not the actual uh, dates where the National Committee uh, offices were established in specific countries. This is just a visual demonstration. And now that I've added the years and I have made sure that my date input format is for years only instead of dates, now I am able to uh, exit the uh, map editing data file and I can click, click play and we can see it plays through the years and it showcases the locations in an icon format or if I switch back over to an area map, I can also uh, utilize it like so and it will play through the years all the same uh, and showcase those specific locations on there. Um, once you're done with creating this map, a couple of things I would suggest doing is adding uh, an additional text block here for the source. In this case, I added uh, the UNICEF page where I grabbed the uh, countries from. And uh, you have a couple of different ways how to share this out. You have uh, the share option, which allows you to publicly or privately share as a, a viewable web link or grab an embed code that you can then uh, embed into uh, your website. Uh, the other way how to export things that works especially well with uh, timeline maps and anything that has a playable aspect to it is just right clicking on the map and exporting it as, for instance, an animated GIF. This is great for social media sharing 
or emails where you want to encode something moving, but you can maybe embed on the website, for instance. But that's definitely another way how you can share. And of course, you can also export it as a static image or PDF uh, for inclusion in documents or even printing out or something similar. And uh, finally, I wanted to conclude today with a couple of examples, both from UNICEF and not with uh, how maps made with Infogram can look like and what they can be used for. Uh, and that's where I'll also wrap up for today. Uh, with the example, the, the first one here is uh, from a couple of years back uh, and re relating to, uh, to, to, to uh, various uh, disease outbreaks across the globe. And one of the things that is utilized really nicely here is the ability to have uh, multiple maps within a single uh, embed container, meaning that you have multiple tabs within this one map. And that can be achieved if you have, let's say, this map and you want to have a second tab on there, you are able to just take in, for instance, I will just duplicate this first page and that will create these switchable tabs where you are then able to change uh, between them like so and your audience will be able to as well. Uh, this is a great example of a grouped map from NRC Health. So they have... Uh, made a survey and they have analyzed the data and grouped that across a map of the United States using color coding uh, to uh, indicate the percentiles of the scores. This is from uh, a bit of a different use case from uh, a mobile app insights company. And so they are analyzing the uh, uh, cost of various advertisements uh, across various devices across regions. So they are utilizing the heat map to, for instance, differentiate the price of certain uh, of these ads across different countries. And then lastly, from transport and environment, uh, this is a great way how to utilize a map as part of a larger data visualization project. It's all 30 pages in this case on the electronic vehicle market. And here you will see that you have the uh, countries highlighted. And if I click on them, I will actually be directed to specific pages with more insight on that specific country in this case. And I can go back and I can click on another country and read more information about that. So that's also a way how to utilize a map as a sort of navigation bar and not just as a standalone um, visual. I'll stop for now right here. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for uh, your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll be sharing out the presentation along with my contact details. And uh, I hope to uh, see some of your infogram creations at some point in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Yanis. Um, we have quite a few questions in the chat. So um, I think maybe some we reserve for the end, especially when it comes to comparison about different tools, but there's one question in specific that I think might be worth looking at right now, uh, which is the one by Hiba, uh, who's asking whether we can add multiple layers to the timeline, such as, for example, overlaying involvement of cholera cases with other metadata, such as locations of flood. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, that's a very good one. So currently, uh, Infogram supports a single timeline map layer. So what that means is in a timeline format, you can have uh, one layer of data. However, you are able to add additional uh, visual aids, such as icons and additional uh, highlight points across a map uh, utilizing uh, separate objects. Uh, but in terms of the pure kind of data layer, there is a, a single data layer functionality in all Infogram maps. That answer your question, Hiba. Um, I think some of you have also remarked that this is fairly fast, and uh, absolutely, um, I think the the objective of today is to give you an overview of what is possible, um, and to have an open door to us and also to Yanis. Um, we also have this learning library where there's a lot of step by step instructions, a few previous webinars about maps where um, we really talk about the details, like you know, for an hour and a half. So. Um, I, I put that link in the in the chat, and hopefully that is that is helpful. Helpful. Um, okay, I'm just looking for a few other specific questions that we can ask you now, Yanis. Um, um, can the maps be interactive when people click on the icon and show data such as names or numbers of that specific location? I believe yes, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so Mozambique. Uh, seems to be that some districts are missing. So Yanis, maybe you can um, 
say a couple of words about uh, custom maps that we've done with a few countries. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so what we need to be able to include the most up-to-date uh, country level maps is typically the uh, geographical uh, shape files, and those can be sent to us uh, to include in your uh, account, or those can be uploaded uh, from within the platform if you have that capability yourselves. Uh, uh, feel free to follow up with me afterwards uh, so we can get those maps included into, in, in the Infogram platform so you can use them uh, as well. Excellent. And then one last, maybe I'll, I'll close questions by now to give Jan some time too, but um, uh, the question about live connections. So Aber is asking, um, how do we feature live feeding of maps? Um, so uh, do we have to upload a file every time or can, can this be done by updating an online sheets? Thank you for that question. And that's uh, once again, a very relevant one. So there are multiple ways how you can get data into Infogram. Static um, Excel files, like I showed today, is one of the options. There is a live integration with uh, Google Spreadsheets specifically, where you're able to update the source file and it will uh, update the Infogram uh, map automatically. Uh, the same functionality is there for uh, SQL queries from databases, as well as uh, JSON feeds uh, that allow this sort of live updating uh, possibilities uh, for the data. Excellent. Well, it seems like yeah, this is uh, seeing a lot of interest here. Yeah, I know there are a few other questions, but um, maybe for the interest of time, we can move on to Jan's uh, presentation. And if we have time left at the end, we can address other uh, unanswered questions. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, thanks, Aniko. Thanks, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, great to be here. So um, let me share the screen. Let me know if you can see the slides. OK. OK, perfect. Thank you. So um, the, the purpose of this uh, quick presentation is just to give you um, uh, kind of a quick overview of what are the other options if you need uh, more advanced uh, mapping geospatial capabilities. So we have a couple of different solutions that we are working on or we already have available at UNICEF that allows you to, to address some of the issues uh, or, or, or uh, functionality requirements that we have mentioned even in this uh, discussion and in the chat, like uh, uh, live connections, integration with single sign-on, custom boundaries, multiple having multiple layers, all these uh, different uh, uh, um, aspects or functionalities are uh, uh, to some extent available in, in uh, other solutions. Um, so I, I don't want to go too much into detail, but just wanted to give you a kind of a quick uh, um, overview of the, the geospatial data landscape at UNICEF. So we have a couple of different solutions in place. Uh, we have commercial solutions like ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Enterprise. These are um, like a very common uh, uh, geospatial online uh, data platforms that allows you to collect, to manage the data, but also to create uh, great visualizations. So we have this uh, whole stack of uh, tools available um, from, um, from S3, uh, which is the vendor working on ArcGIS. Um, we are also working on two open source solutions, GeoRepo and GeoSite, and I will briefly mention about uh, their functionalities. In short, GeoRepo aims at addressing the problem of uh, having um, up-to-date, uh, official, curated, and managed version over time administrative boundaries for all the countries in the world at the subnational level. Um, uh, while GeoSide is uh, kind of uh, our um, web-based uh, geospatial BI platform, I would say. Um, uh, and obviously, there are other data systems uh, in place that we have, uh, like uh, SDMX Data Warehouse, where UNICEF manages all the official uh, indicators. Uh, we have other uh, tools like uh, Magazine, Micro Data Catalog, uh, ODK tools for data collection. Just wanted to give you kind of a glimpse of the, you know, of these different tools and how they are all uh, connected. Um, so um, 
In terms of more uh, advanced, at least more advanced in terms of uh, cartographic or mapping geospatial functionalities, uh, we have a couple of tools available. Uh, I'm sure many of you are uh, very familiar with, with Power BI. Um, uh, the, like a very specific geospatial solution is ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online, and ArcGIS Enterprise, um, as well as this open source platform, uh, Geosite. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, like main features. Each platform has its own uh, um, use cases, its own type of users, types of visualizations, set of functionalities, and uh, and, and also challenges. Um, in the Power BI, uh, there are several different uh, mapping visuals that are available for end users. Obviously, Power BI is very powerful in terms of data processing, data analysis. So if you need to clean up the data, join data, build more complex data models, combine different uh, uh, sources into, into one data model, Power, Power BI is, is super powerful. Um, there are some um, default mapping visuals uh, uh, for creating uh, color-coded choroplet maps, as well as um, you can uh, map point locations data. Um, there are options to uh, to use uh, custom boundaries in Power BI, but it also requires uploading static GeoJSON or TopoJSON files, which is a little bit uh, maybe uh, difficult to, to manage over time. Um, so you can do subnational mapping, but each each visual has also some limitations. When you want to map data based on uh, location names, they have to be uh, compatible with the backend Bing Maps engine, uh, which uh, proves to be very challenging, especially for subnational data, especially for uh, some countries uh, like uh, more remote. Uh, um, locations, uh, these um, geocoding mechanisms that always work uh, correctly. Uh, ArcGIS, it's more um, like a, a focused geospatial platform where you can uh, manage and upload and map uh, multiple layers of data, different types of uh, data sets, uh, like location of roads, uh, uh, health facilities, office, UNICEF offices, border crossings. You can also use satellite imagery. Um, so there are different ways of visualizing the data. You can uh, uh, have symbols, you, ha you can use choroplet maps, you can use hotspot label, you can put labels on maps. So very, very advanced mapping uh, capabilities. You can have multiple layers uh, on top of each other. Um, you can create uh, dashboards, online maps, but also uh, this whole ArcGIS online package has a couple of additional applications where you can create story maps, like a, a different um, uh, types of uh, online products. Uh, you can also link ArcGIS uh, online with uh, desktop uh, GIS solutions where you can edit the data, you can upload the data. Um, maps can also be embedded on other websites. Uh, however, this is a, a paid license. Uh, we are working on, <laughs> and, um, we are really very close to finalizing the, the enterprise agreement with S3 um, that would give us uh, wider access to the software. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I can. Uh, I, I will share some some more uh, details and links to additional resources uh, later. Um, Geosite tries to is, is an in-house uh, custom uh, web-based platform. Um, it uh, will allow you to um, integrate with different data sources. You will be able to uh, uh, visualize the data using color-coded uh, country and subnational boundaries. You can create pie chart maps. You can have 3D visualizations. You can have multiple map overlays, multiple layers. It's uh, dedicated, it's focused um, uh, on uh, making uh, subnational data mapping as easy as possible. It's also integrated with GeoRepo, uh, which means that uh, a GeoRepo takes care of managing administrative boundaries over time. So uh, GeoSite is linked to GeoRepo, always having the latest admin boundaries um, available. Uh, it's very easy to upload the data, to update the data over time, to manage time series data. 
you can also automate the data ingestion, data harvesting. Um, you can visualize multiple layers at a time. You can have widgets, charts, uh, advanced filtering, analysis options. So lots of uh, additional capabilities. I don't want to um, spend too much time because I know we, we still need to have a time for uh, Q&A, but I'll just go through some slides. Uh, there are, and uh, in the presentation, you will be able to find links to additional resources. Um, we had a dedicated webinar uh, some time ago on uh, mapping in Power BI. So uh, if you are interested in learning more about different mapping visuals, uh, you will have a link to the to the separate PowerPoint. Uh, and you, you have this, this one slide that kind of summarizes different um, features and, and uh, constraints or considerations that you need to keep in mind when working with Power BI and, to, um, and mapping data in Power BI. Um, in terms of ArcGIS Online, we have two instances. We have ArcGIS Online, which is kind of more public facing, and also ArcGIS Enterprise, ArcGIS Portal, which is um, integrated, is installed on our UNICEF infrastructure. It's integrated with uh, our single sign-on so everyone can access the platform as a viewer. We have also a pool of, um, uh, we will have through this enterprise agreement, we'll have a pool of licenses for uh, creators, those who need to edit and authorize content. Um, GeoRepo, I've mentioned that the, uh, the purpose of GeoRepo is to, to manage uh, administrative boundaries at the sub-national level uh, over time. Uh, and GeoSite, uh, as I've mentioned, we see this as an open source uh, kind of uh, web-based uh, geospatial BI solution. It has, uh, what's interesting is uh, it tries to address some of these issues that uh, you have mentioned in your questions. Uh, admin boundaries are managed through GeoRepo. Um, we have connectors to SharePoint Excel files, to SDMX data warehouse. Uh, you can easily handle time series data. It is fully controlled uh, um, and accessed uh, through API. So you can automate uh, uh, data input and output. Uh, so lots of additional um, uh, functionalities. Um, uh, in the presentation, you will also find a link to the uh, to the video, uh, which gives you a good understanding of uh, what you can do. And maybe just to to kind of uh, show you very very quick, quickly, just one minute, um, how the this platform looks like. You can switch between different admin levels. So you can visualize the data uh, using different uh, uh, hierarchies. You can play, you can visualize the same indicators over time. You can see that the same is reflected on the, on the chart here, on the time series chart. Um, we can also have a kind of Power BI-like solution where we have uh, slicers in the map so you can see, for instance, where partner B uh, had some interventions in the wash sector, maybe. So, so we can have dynamic uh, data slicing. We have uh, we can have additional data analysis. You can create custom filters. For instance, we're looking at districts where indicator A and B were about 60%, and you can uh, play this over time. You can also uh, visualize the data in three dimensions, uh, uh, removing the filters. And so maps can also be, so this interface may be a little bit of uh, like overwhelming for some users, but you can still embed the map. You can turn off for when you embed, you can turn off different elements and you can just embed a simple map like this as well. So lots of different options uh, and you will find in the presentation additional links to um, to the resources about Geosite as well. And just to conclude, uh, if you need more uh, like a geospatial support, um, we have a dedicated LTA contracts with uh, dedicated geospatial vendors who can help you uh, in your data, geospatial data visualization uh, work. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Um, there's actually one comment about GeoSite um, in the Q&A. Um, see, Noor is saying uh, GeoSite is still not perfect in that in representing communities and only work with static data. But what you're saying is it's hooked up to API. Uh, well, um, so in terms of, uh, so in GeoSite, you can map uh, any data at any level. 
uh, if you have custom uh, boundaries uh, at the community level, if these data, if these boundaries are not available in GeoRepo, users can still upload custom shape files to GeoRepo and use this as a reference for mapping data in GeoSite. Um, you can actually map data even using like a custom, I know, hexagon or squares or whatever reference layers you have. So there is like a full flexibility. Um, uh, I didn't mention, but uh, we are now in the process of deploying both GeoRepo and GeoSite to UNICEF infrastructure. Both tools will be uh, linked, uh, will be integrated with our single sign-on. And this should happen, like we are actually currently at this moment working on, on this integration. So it should be available to, to users within the next couple of weeks at latest. Um, everyone will have access to the tool um, and everyone will be able to map data using their own boundaries as well. But we will have a curated official administrative uh, uh, database of um, uh, admin boundaries available at the subnational level. Obviously, not all the countries will have data down to level three or four, but um, um, uh, the platforms are able to, to accommodate and uh, uh, use this kind of data if, if this data becomes available. Um, one follow-up question. So points are supported or only polygon? So in, in GeoSide, um, you can actually visualize uh, all type of uh, geospatial layers or data. Uh, the, the, we have two types of layers. Uh, one are called indicator layers, and these are polygon layers. So they can be uh, districts, provinces, or country polygons, or they can be any other polygons like hexagon grid or whatever. But this is a polygon layer. Uh, we can we, for these indicator layers that are using polygons as a reference we have two types of um, data visualization one is choroplet maps where you color code polygons and you can have a custom uh, you know classifications and you can define the color as, as you want uh, but you can also create pie charts so if you want to compare like two different indicators at the same time uh, you can create pie charts instead of color coding uh, individual districts. But on top of this indicator layer, these indicator layers, we can overlay any other uh, uh, layers uh, that we want. So they can be a location of health facilities, they can be roads, uh, ports. We pull this, these additional layers from external platforms like ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise or uh, GeoNode or other open source uh, platforms. So you can map any layers in GeoSide, uh, but there are two types of layers. Each comes with different functionality. Uh, but uh, comparing to, to like an uh, infogram, for instance, the most uh, kind of uh, the, the main type of layer is indicator layer, where, where we map different indicators against districts, uh, provinces, and so on. Thank you so much, Jan. There's so much richness in there, and I saw a lot of people clapping and writing that this is exactly what they need. So I think uh, just please um, make sure that that all the links to your previous presentations and the SharePoint page are in there, and it might be worth doing another webinar also um, as as a potential offering to to this group um, uh, in in more depth and detail. Um, so. Um, yeah, and, and here's exactly the question, similar to the Infogram library, is there a learning library documents for learning uh, for GeoSite users? Um, I'm actually not sure, Jan. Um, uh, I will share the links uh, to some resources that we have. This is an in-house tools a tool that is uh, still being developed. So we yeah. are adding new functionalities on a daily basis. So it's still a very dynamic and evolving project, but mm -hmm. uh, we are also working mm -hmm. on the manuals and, and uh, we'll have webinars, uh, definitely. Great. Perfect. Um, and maybe now a question to our audience also. Um, if you have experience with these tools, if you have specific use cases that you would like to share with the community, um, or if you have a use case that, that made an impact, we would love to amplify that. We would love to learn about that and highlight that to, to all of us, um, because this is, how, this is how we learn um, and celebrate success. Um, so, so please don't be shy and let us know. 
<laughs> on that note, Hanok left uh, shared a link to the SharePoint site, but Hanok, that's uh, we don't have permission to view that. So if you could share with me a link that's available to everyone in UNICEF, I can include that in the, uh, the follow-up email. Um, I think it would be great to see like actual examples of what each office is doing. Um, I, it's always that kind of example is always welcomed and people would love to see that. So thank you for sharing. But if you could make that link available to everyone, uh, we would love to see that. Um, yes. So that, there was one question at the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm just seeing how many other questions. I think uh, colleagues, now is the time to to type in any questions in general, you know, not just for Jan, but but for for all of us. Um, um, but um, there was one question at the beginning about Power BI versus Infogram. So um, I don't know if if uh, you know this presentation answered these these questions, um, or or if we should still go a little bit more in depth. Um, we had actually invited Antonio. Uh, no, sorry, Alfonso Vaca Flores and his colleague Macy to this meeting. Um, they are uh, from ICD Business Intelligence, and they they're very very well versed in everything Power BI. Um, but I think I don't know if Macy is on this call now, but uh, Antonio unfortunately couldn't make it. Alfonso. Um, so so at some point I think it's worth going into more depth on that and having maybe a more specific session on that because Power BI is is the UNICEF. Um, enterprise tool for dashboards. Um, in, in general, I, I think knowing both tools myself to some extent, I feel like um, Infogram has a has a lower learning curve. It's, it's a little bit easier to learn. Um, it is a little bit more um, explanatory. Um, so more, uh, somewhat more infographic style, a little bit, um, you know, uh, more advocacy um, and, and uh, Dashboard solutions such as such as Power BI or Tableau are more exploratory. So you can work more with filters. You can really showcase a lot more data that then interacts with each other. I think the other big point to mention is that, of course, Power BI is, is integrated with our systems. So anything with personally identifiable data um, that, that is risky in some way uh, yeah, should be on our UNICEF system. So uh, Infogram. I think mostly is, you know, it's not, you know, we're not using single sign on, um, of course, you know, we, we follow all confidentiality um, rules and regulations, but still, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a different uh, level of security classification. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I hope that's answering this question. And, uh, and as I said, uh, please pick up if it's if not, and we can go more into detail on that on dashboards in general, maybe. Right. Um, um, Abir actually shared two uh, links to their web Jordan website, and they're both and they they use Infogram, and um, it's really great. So um, I'll also include that in the follow up email too. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, actually, that's really yeah, and there is a question about uh, I think it's GeoSight. Is it possible to link Insight? Solange, you mean GeoSight with ArcGIS and to visualize data like with Power BI? Does that question make sense, Yael? Uh, sorry to make a, uh, uh, is it possible to link uh, ArcGIS with uh, GeoSight? Is I think that that's the question? what she means. Uh, she put insight, but I think it means GeoSight. Is that? No, it might be insight. It might be our insight. Um, you know, Kiyo and ask, uh, answer a question about it last time. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I think so. Yeah. Well, so, so I could uh, just say that uh, uh, we are working with, um, with uh, other teams, uh, including the, the Vision, uh, RAM, uh, Insight team to, to see uh, how best we can integrate uh, those internal platforms with GeoSight, also eTools and, and, and other systems. Uh, so we can actually bring uh, some, some indicators from these tools uh, uh, and map them in GeoSight. Obviously, there are lots of uh, like uh, challenges in terms of uh, harmonizing the use of uh, admin names and, and stuff like that. But uh, uh, technically, this is uh, uh, this is possible, uh, as, I as, I as I said, uh, you can bring data to GeoSite or you can bring to take data from GeoSite to our systems through API very easily. 
Thank you. Um, any other questions? I think we're almost at the end of our time, but if you have any last minute questions, you could um, address them here. Um, yeah. Doesn't look like it. I um, In uh, closing, I have um, another maybe smaller announcement that doesn't have to do with maps specifically, but it has to do with data visualization. Uh, we recently had um, a brown bag on empathetic data storytelling in the age of AI and um, recorded that. So since we talked about some of the new advances in AI during the last webinar, I thought it might be useful for the group to, to take a look and maybe also sign up for future webinars on this topic specifically. Um, so I'm, I'm pasting that link into the chat. And um, oh, I can do that, yeah. And um, yeah, if there's no other questions, I would like to thank Tomiko for organizing this webinar so well and for the hard work that went to in, into it. I'd like to thank Yanis for his time and the excellent presentation. Um, I'm sure we're getting a lot more uh, requests now again for this and uh, thank you for your great support over the years. And Jan, thanks for being groundbreaking in geospatial work at UNICEF. It's very much needed. And thank you everybody for coming. Yeah. Thank you. So the next another session will be held uh, in June, but the uh, information about that detail about that will be sent to you uh, in the coming weeks. So thank you everybody for joining. Bye. Thank you so much.